Welcome to the one within all to the universe. I'm your host chance here to play the archetypal hype man in your ear to remind you that you're on this journey of life, not to show other people how great you are, but to show others how great they are. These wise words derived from the book of our epic guest today, the entrepreneurial mermaid waymaker and alchemical resistance breaker, who is also the host of the King Heroes Journey podcast. Beth Martins is a magical name, and by typing this spell into a Google search, you'll be blessed with a cavalcade of creative content, including original music, writing, videos, and teaching on all sorts of topics we tend to converge with here on Interverse, like yoga, self-empowerment through gnosis, conspiratorial crises, sovereignty solutions, archetypal psychology, and tons more. I recently popped into her channel for a great episode on the Ring of Truth, which was very fun. You can find that on YouTube by searching for Beth Martins, spelled M-A-R-T-E-N-S. And of course, her website and everything else you might need to find her will be linked in the show notes, wherever you're accessing this podcast from. And I just read Beth's book after we had that conversation a few weeks ago, and it was quite an amazing journey through the archetypes and uh, even someone like myself who's already familiar with these concepts deeply was able to gain a lot of self-knowledge from looking at the the shadows and the superpowers of all these containers for our energy that we shift between all the time, wearing one persona and the next, and encountering them in our external reality, sometimes as a destroyer element, when we've tried to repress them within ourselves. So... We've got a lot to talk about with Beth today. Very excited about it. As usual, you can find the second hour of the conversation on Patreon by subscribing for five bucks a month. Not a bad deal if you ask me, but I'm really, really excited. So I want to just go ahead and start this conversation with the royalty of soul retrieval known as Beth Martins. And as the alchemist says, I manifest through my visions when I'm clear. And I think that this conversation and this content will be something that really helps you clear up your filters and <laughs> bring more of that light of potential and imagination into your life. Beth, thank you for being here and welcome to the Interverse. Thank you, Chance, for having me. That was an amazing introduction. Could be the best ever. I might have to take some words out of there for you. Wow, <laughs> thanks. From, from you. That yeah, was a fun one yeah. for me because it was half written and half on the fly. And I felt like the writing part got me on the flow of the on the fly part as if it was just continuing the writing process. So that might be a trick I do in the future, kind of partially write it. <laughs> yeah, so good. So much oozing creativity. Well, you're a great author too, I got to say. Mm. And I, I read a lot of people's books that are some, sometimes self-published and uh, not everybody has the same level of gift. And I think that most people have, I've talked to on this show have been very gifted, but you're particularly gifted with the words and your personal story is probably one of the most intense ones you could go through, which is a brush with death quite not even really a brush kind of like a bear hug right <laughs> if you want to yeah. fill our audience in a little bit on your backstory that would be awesome absolutely and thank you for the kind words about my book it is a thrill to hear that literally <laughs> as authors know there's a lot that goes into that book so it's no little thing and uh, so I was uh, working in my family's firm in the uh, 90s. I was born and raised in the business world because my parents were entrepreneurs. And uh, I, after a degree in anthropology, was literally qualified to do nothing for a living. So I thought, well, I could uh, use this as a way to earn my way back to India and do all the things that I really want to do. And so I went for this sideways train and uh, it was a train wreck, actually. At, in, the, in the end, you know, I found a great big lump in my neck and I went for a diagnosis, turned out to be a stage four lymphoma, even though I thought I was just being a hypochondriac to get out of that line of work that was really severely out of alignment with me. I, I finally realized it the hard way. And it took me three years to recover against the odds. I was diagnosed a second time. I had a, a near-death experience the first time just due to all the treatments that were so severe. And, uh, and then by the end, when they figured that I'm not going to survive after a second diagnosis, 
They tried to offer me a stem cell transplant. Half the people died doing that. So it brought me up against a wall I never thought I would be up against. And deciding between what I, you know, what they're telling me is my life and this much bigger growing awareness of my own soul and and the importance of the life of that, not just this, uh, you know, the cells and the breathing and and all the things that we understand to be life, but the, the deeper element. And so I looked in that mirror and I stared at myself and I was very lucky to have accessed Carolyn Miss's book at the time. She she just published Magically on Archetypes and I had been following her work. So I, I took it home. I didn't even know what it was about. I started to work through it like it was my full-time job. And by seeing one archetype that was so particularly out of alignment w- with me, you know, now, now I might joke and call it a, a, a mermaid. Then I was calling it the rebel more you know, more of a masculine, but it doesn't really matter. That's, that's my past life in, in feminism. And when I saw the shadow that was really uh, so blatant for me, everybody in my life saw it, but I didn't see it. Then I began to make a, an energy shift. You know, I didn't even have really any tools to, to deal with it the way I do now in a much faster way. But by looking those, those shadows in the face, I was able to bring them to the light. There are no more shadows. I reclaimed enough energy that next thing you know, I went from dying of cancer to healing from cancer. And I never had to look back. My oncologist, as he read in my book, didn't want to hear the details of how I survived. He ended up committing suicide himself, I have to imagine, because his work was just so bleak. And so from then on, after I recovered and I had a lot of secrets under my belt and the archetype studies went on, I knew for a fact I was never going to go back into the corporate world. Um, You know, I still love business. I still love marketing. I ended up circling around and and becoming a business coach as well as working with the archetypes and releasing and deprogramming. Uh, But luckily, I never had to set foot in that that jurisdiction again now that I I know it to be a, uh, you know, sort of its own law court where you are in somebody else's control. And uh, and so that's always been my my hope for myself and for other people that they could make their living uh, uh, something that would support life. What a concept. (laughs) So I feel very fortunate having done that. I and, loved yeah. the case studies you shared in the book. And would you remind us the full title of that? Yes. And I just happen to have a copy right here. It's taken me a while to get my own book, if you can believe it, but it's called Journey. And it's a map of archetypes to find lost purpose in a sea of meaninglessness. And this is what I consider to be the ailment of humanity at this time. It's, uh, it's that life doesn't mean anything. There's nothing worth working for. There's no true intrinsic purpose. Now, that's not across the board, of course. You're you're a shining example of somebody who's absolutely purpose-driven. You show all the symptoms of that. (laughs) And, uh, you know, if people could go beneath that surface and, and see who they actually are and the power that they really have... This world would change. That's that's my vision and what I feel to be my work on this uh, on this earth. Me too. In the mm-hmm. most pure basic sense, the reason I do this is because I wanted to show people that whatever somebody that they admired was doing, that that person was actually a human being like them. And the only difference between us and our heroes is the time and effort and energy and attention and refinement and all these different aspects of alchemizing ourself that you so beautifully lay out in the story of the archetype and the hero journey. And I, man, Thank you. what I really like too, about what you said, and in the title of the book, you know, navigating the meaninglessness of life. This is a, a question that people can be touchy about. It's like, if you try to say that, well, there's no actual meaning in anything that's inherent uh, people will be like, well, then you're a moral relativist or yeah, this or that. If you try to say that it's actually uh, empowering that we choose the meaning for our lives, it doesn't mean that you're, in my opinion, that doesn't mean that you're like anti-God or something or anti-nature, that you are choosing meaning and that we're morality creating beings. It's what we do. I think that uh, while there might be like a sort of absolute truth in a meaning of natural law in terms of moral law and how we treat one another, all of that is actually only enforced by our own energy systems in the way that we punish or reward ourselves for our own good or bad behavior uh, 
whether that's from the natural evils of by what I mean by that would be like poison and toxicity from an environment that we got out of balance with or the unnatural evils of psychopathy and, and abuse and things like that. At the end of the day, all of those are shaping us into morality creating beings. And if morality was just something that existed outside of us uh, as an absolute, and then that was the reason why we had to follow it. Doesn't it take away the value of the choosing of morality? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It's pretty loaded, and I won't even pretend to have an absolute answer to that one. Uh, but, you know, I do say, as you, as you saw in my chapter on the lover archetype, that we, we have an inherent knowing from, from the earliest of age. When, when something is wrong, all of the cells of your body tell you that that's not right, that it's, it's not going to support life or it's not going along with what um, you know, should be get into all kinds of weird things about what should be compared to what is. And this is a co-creation in my, in my perspective. We, we are uh, Im- embedded with the spark of God. We've given, we've been given dominion with that spark. People are only aware of the tiniest fraction of their free will, which is the choice and that, and that ability to constantly create and and then by not being aware of it, it can seem as if it's not even there. And so then then you have to start turning to much more relativistic kind of frameworks for your morals. And you can be talked into things like, you know, right now uh, it's been ongoing, but it's going to ramp up the, that they want us to be OK with pedophilia. Because, oh, well, that's a, a psychological disease and we have to feel sorry for those people. That's always the first step to have some empathy with the, the, the psychopath that can do that and have no feelings about it, have no regret or remorse or pain inside themselves. You know, that can be the definition of, of immoral where there's no response and uh, so the more you get in touch with your own true nature, the to me, the more uh, obvious morality becomes it's 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 there is a certain thing about it being decided and it's not like a policy statement or a list of rules that you that you come across it's always only ever alive in a uh, a moment that's that true morality you can't you can't codify it you can't put it on paper you know it, it's true that every situation will will bring a different level of of your own morality up but at the end of the day, I have so much faith in my own ability to know in the moment what is right and what is wrong. And as you go along in the path, you probably notice that the, you know, a, a big infraction of my own morals used to be, you know, the pain I suffered then is it, when there's just even the tiniest infraction of my own morals is like, oh, man, I need to fix that, right? I need to make it right somehow. There's this, this so much pain around it. And that's good. That's actually electromagnetic magnetic force, that pain. And it can be harvested if you allow yourself to actually go through and see what's on the other side rather than trying to dumb down, you know, numb it out and go, oh, well, come up with some reason because that's, you know, that's actually a real abuse or inversion of reason that that was okay. So how's that for an answer? It's a great answer, especially emphasizing that it's like part of the body. It actually just comes up and out of your body, the feeling of right and wrong. And that it's okay to trust that and that the the evacuated or self-murdered person is the one that has fully shut off that voice from deep in their belly or in their heart, however you want to, you know, illustrate that. But it is, uh, <laughs> that was a really curvy curveball to throw at you right at the beginning, that good old question on morality and absolute truth, because it's like, uh, it's kind of a, an aperture that you can see through both ways. Like uh, that there is something absolute about it, but that there's something subjective about it. But at the end of the day, I think the most valuable thing to think about morality is like that you choose that you're making a choice and that you're um, doing good for good's sake, right? For right's sake, helping for helping's sake. And that plays out through like the entire story of the archetypes in the hero's journey. Some archetypes more than others. Like I found a lot of identification with the nurturer archetype, interestingly mm-hmm. enough. Mm, most people in my world do. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd love it if you could kind of give us your 
explanation of how you use the word archetypes. What one thing I like about what you say in the book is that they are not conscious; they are a container or a shell. And as shells do, they filter, channel, and give shape to conscious God energy. So that's a good explanation, right, from your book. But if you could expand on that a little more, and maybe even a little further down the line, give us an example of how you've been able to work with a client. You know, you can hide, obscure the names and locations or whatever. But you know, an example, sort of an example story of why that's something that can really help a pattern breaking and you know moving into the next phase. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Exactly. Yeah. Once you recognize a pattern, you have found what I call to be gold on your, on your path, right? If the hero's journey is a, is a quest for gold and the, the wealth and abundance that is uh, good health and good relationships and a good life experience, then, then uh, you're, you're that, you know, I always want to tell people if you, if you find crappy stuff and bad feelings and programming and stuff that's holding you back and negative patterns, you actually found gold. So I just wanted to get that point across. And um, so what I, what I see an archetype as, first of all, anything that I'm going to say is metaphor. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't uh, uh, pretend to know this structure. You cannot put a, an archetype under a microscope and see it. But I've still had many, you know, visions and many uh, states of awareness that lead me to see that archetypes are something that have, um, you know, it, 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 let me back it up a little bit, that we're being convinced right now that say our governments are here to create order out of chaos, right? Isn't there a, a specific phrase, order out of chaos, the Templars or something? I'm, I'm not Order ab chaos, baby. That's that Freemason slang. There you go. Exactly. And so that's the big lie. And what archetypes did for me was to see that not only is nature highly ordered and you can see how the seasons work and, you know, the transmutation of, of water into uh, mist or what you know whatever predictable order there is it also is there at the level of our psyches so it's not just a mess and it was laying down for three years trying to recover from cancer that allowed me to do this incredibly deep inward journey i i couldn't take any almost any outward stimulation at times i was so damaged by chemotherapy that i i, I just had to be inward and quiet and so it, it had me constantly studying this inner world that had so much complexity, I was staggered. I was taken aback all the time. And within that complexity, though, at the same time, here I discovered this order. And it was at the, the 11th hour for me, as I, as I mentioned, my back was up against a wall. And so just, just going in through the window of of archetypes <clears throat> and seeing through them it's taken me 20 years now since uh, since recovering to to break all of this down it would be tempting to think of them as living creatures or beings and there were times when i called on archetypes as if they were but i came out the other side and saw no that that it's actually god calling through archetypes and it is it is the order of the the conscious experience that each being is having I have to say human beings, you know, we don't know about the the animals experience. I don't think it's going on for them. And it what it's what makes each one unique, you know, so I like to talk about it like it's a lens and it's got a particular color to it. And when when God light shines through that lens, it comes up with Chance Garten, right? The the infinitely unique Chance Garten. There's no other like you. And there's no other like me. And there, it, God has never replicated in all his time of creation, which I find absolutely amazing, right? So, so the, the archetype becomes a, maybe a substratum or, or, or a, a place through which all of that can funnel. Uh, because while you may be unique, as you were just talking about a little bit with the nurturer archetype and how that is just an ongoing theme in my world that almost everybody has some of those shadows, then we can start to, out of, out of this infinite variety, tap into an order that can be followed, that can, you can, if they're like breadcrumbs and you see, 
you know, people have done the work. They've come before us, uh, those who, who st- who've studied archetypes. And you can literally just look at an archetype profile that I've, for example, provided in my book. And you can see like ding, 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 especially in the shadows is where the, the recognition of, of an archetype that's very close to you will, will uh, come to your awareness. And then that archetype becomes a, um, a vehicle to the self-awareness, to, to bringing up from the unconscious that w- which uh, you didn't know. That's why they call it the unconscious. <laughs> Everybody else knows it, but you didn't know it. And, uh, and then you can recover your energy from it. So that, the, the, you know, the archetype is maybe a blueprint, a spiritual blueprint, an, an emotional blueprint. Also, the emotional and, and spiritual world are, are highly tied in to one another. And because it is a wall of complexity in, at the level of our soul, using archetypes is a way to simplify a, a point of entry Right. My, I, I studied only archetypes academically in school, but once I applied them, I got results practically immediately. And, you know, it's not because I know how to heal from cancer or I have any big insights and I tried everything at that point. It was, it was really the factor of I was no longer suppressing a very important part of myself that could be represented in this, in this archetype. Once I stopped suppressing it, I had enough courage to look at those shadows and go like, I did it, which is the title of my next book, by the way, and take responsibility. All of that energy came back to me and it went like, oh, do, 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 do. Here's, here's how I heal from cancer. Job's done. This that is job ama- was done. <laughs> this is amazing. It's amazing. I think uh, I've done some recent work with Eileen Day McCusick and stuff on biofield tuning and and other types of biodynamic health uh, topics. And I want to get into doing more of that. But what I'm starting to put together in my mind is like a framework, not quite materially, but in the subtle energy realm, a mental framework that kind of describes to me what goes on here. And so I think that there's something innate in our core that is like this God light, like you said, there's this infinite potential that then sort of percolates through the filters of our unique apparatus and projects a unique universe for us from our perspective that we're in the middle of. And so it's like, the same light is coming through each apparatus, which are different people, but they're getting a different reality tunnel, a different perspective on truth, a different personality expression and all that. But in our fields, it's not just our body and our core where this energy resides. It's meant to like sort of flow from the core out. And then there's information on the outside that it is picked up and then transmitted sort of to the core in a way like where these human Mars rovers or something (laughs) spiritual (laughs) rovers. But uh, this energy that we hold on to through trauma and through crystallized belief that is uh, stagnant, stagnant, these are become more opaque filters in a way like the light in that direction in your field can't go out as far. And there's like an actual anatomy to this, like the left shoulder, Offset, offset the left shoulder correlates to sadness, like the right core, things on the right side of your field correlate to mother or further back in the ancestry towards grandmothers and left to the paternal side. And there's all this amazing information you can get out of that. But I, what I want to see happen, and maybe this is something I'll have to try to, you know, merge myself through thinking about it is how the dynamics of the biofield also play into the dynamics of the archetypes because we can know that certain parts of the field, if there's stagnant energy there, that is going to show up as certain types of emotional situations, which those will have correlates to archetypes because archetypes will have one archetype will have a certain pitfall that others don't necessarily have. Right. But there's also the fact, and this is where I'm going with this, that uh, archetypes energy that we repress in ourselves that has an archetypal shape or feel to it, if it gets super repressed, it comes back to us in the form of an actual living person or a real world event or situation that embodies the shadow of that archetype in a way that's so, so blatant that sometimes you almost die from it, as you know. So I, I kind of want to talk about, about that dynamic, the, uh, the way that it's not even just our personality and our body that is influenced by these containers that we call archetypes, but how it actually even, the, 
our personal dynamics inter- internally influence the way that what you would call manifestation or the, the light of source constructs itself into the people that you meet and the things that happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really my favorite stuff to talk about. <laughs> or <some of. laughs> It's so good. Yeah. Because we're in the realm of collective consciousness. That's another thing to say about archetypes that uh, can be almost uh, too obvious to say, but I should not forget. And so we are having both experiences. I know your chance over there and I'm Beth over here and I'm not going to forget that because of uh, collective consciousness. But also, you know, you must have had those experiences of, of, of being so deeply connected and feeling one with other people, right? That you're, you, you know yourself to be in, in, that, um, in that same feel just as if we're in the ocean and we are uh you know fish but we're all in the same sea is is just one metaphor for that that collectivity uh so the the you know the so the in and the out the in inside yourself and the outside yourself are 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 kind of a blur in that respect and yes so what i've noticed is that when something is out of alignment i will get a small symptom of some kind right it could be a pain in my body it could be you know a state of mind that i can't get out of i'll get some sign of it and if i listen to those more subtle signs inward signs then i can t- i can deal with it very matter of factly very quickly inexpensively <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't take a whole lot of time and energy and big mystery and everything but if you don't listen to things at that subtle level then you will get bigger signs and if you're not willing to listen to anything here it it will start blowing up out there Mind you, it's not like uh, if you if you get it in here, you won't have situations out there. But I do notice as I go along, uh, my problems don't really show up out there that much anymore. And it's it, hard to get sympathy from anybody when I'm having a hard time. It's like, Bethel, look around. There's nothing. Nobody's trying to kill you. Nobody's taking you down. There's nothing really wrong. And you know my my reasoning for that it's it's not that we're playing this vicious game and that these suppressed archetypes uh, turn into your enemy out of some you know it's, they're not like psychopaths it's actually all in your favor it's all totally rigged for your freedom which to me is the destination of each soul that we were all headed there sooner or later that is that is our true nature and so when those shadows pop up either as symptoms inside yourself or as situations out there which is very common then it's a gift it's it's getting your attention right i had to wait till a stage 4 lymphoma it's not that i didn't have many many signs and awareness inside myself and banging my head against the shower wall every morning going how do i get out of this life i i did know it i already knew it but i just didn't know how to listen i didn't see a way out, way out so god found a way for me oh i can handle that for you you want out here you go <laughs> stage 4 lymphoma full stop how's that <laughs> How are we doing? Right. But I got results I didn't want. And that's the difference. So if you if you take on working with archetypes uh, yourself and you decide like a king hero, I'm just going to go in and discover my own shadows. I don't have any particular big problem necessarily to solve, but I'm going to treat this like an adventure and a game. It's the hero's journey. I know I have to take it. And uh, and wow, I see a shadow there, and I can work on that. I can you know find my way to release the energy that's tied up there. Uh, I was going to say, by the way, you were asking for a real life example, and, and a beautiful client came to mind whose name I won't use, but she came to me with a series of what she considered to be different problems. And uh, it, it was we, I worked for her for quite some time. We did a number of different projects together. She built her business with, with me. But the first thing on the outset was to show her that every single one of the problems she suffered, for example, looking after her son who kept getting into some kind of trouble or another or uh, trying to help her husband that was going through a number of things with his work and transitions and, and um, there was an ailing parent parent in the scene in fact i think there was two ailing parents in the scene and i think there was five or six different situations that she thought she had to solve out in working with us and working with with me 
And what I was able to see is that actually all of those problems were one shadow of one archetype, the nurturer. At the end of the day, it, it might not have been so um, uh, simple as that. This is an oversimplification. I will, I will clearly admit that. But what it did is it, it gave her a place to begin working and not on all of those people in her life and not trying to solve out all those problems because when you're holding problems in mind, chances are you're actually part of creating that problem, problem kind of what you're, you're alluding to there. And so she just went head to head with her nurturer archetype and said, okay, shadow, I see you now in a lot of different situations in all different areas of my life, whether it was her work or finances, her own health, her family, her relationships. And, uh, and, it, and it simplified it. Then, then she, she went to work deprogramming at that level and was able to have breakthroughs. Uh, her, her business completely took off. She, she had no more problem charging people for her amazing artwork uh, relationships got, got simpler. It didn't totally solve out everybody's problem, but it solved her problem in, in worrying and pouring her energy into holding the wrong picture of them in mind. So that's just an example of how that can work in, a, in, in your favor. Once you discover shadows, it is painful. And she's like, Ugh, oh my God, I can't believe this. And yet, and, and then you get to take responsibility for it. What that means is that you gain power. Right? As long as you see it as a, a whole bunch of things out there, you have no control over that whatsoever, but you have total control over this and inside yourself and, and how you manifest because what you hold in mind is truly what is going to manifest. Now you, now you have to contend with the conscious and the unconscious. The unconscious tends to have more power. So what we unconsciously hold in mind uh, can easily manifest. It's got the, the power of the collective unconscious behind it. And so to me, that's why it's so important to to bring the shadows to light. Yeah, I mean, when they say the collective unconscious, it's like they're saying that the collective is the unconscious. There's you, there's the conscious mind and the things that you can in one moment assess in both your direct focal gaze and peripheral vision. And then there, and then, you know, your wider field around you. And then there's all the other stuff that you know exists, even if you don't even know exactly what it is or what their face looks like or whatever. And that's all out there beyond the field of your peripheral vision and your immediate biorhythm. And that's the collective and it's the unconscious. I kind of never put that together before, but they're literally, it's sort of like a redundancy, the collective and the unconscious. If you understand it, you're saying the same thing. And that's far out. And I really like what you said about Basically, to summarize, that archetypes serve the empirical empirical self. They only ever did. They're not. They're not there to be like your tormentor or something. Nobody nope. exists, in, and that's another trip that people sometimes don't want to take. Which is that uh, evil. There is such a thing as evil, but that it's all also in a way artificial. Like it's not necessarily like the true reality. The deepest, truest reality holds no evil. It re like e all one way that I like to put it is that evil is artificial. Like not everything artificial is evil, but everything evil comes from artifice or something that wouldn't have existed in nature without our input or our distortion or our filter. And that's okay too. Like uh, even perception requires something to be obscured for us to perceive anything. That's why like, there's this dynamic of the conscious and the unconscious. But I really like that idea that people should keep in mind that the archetypes are there to serve their empirical self. I don't want to say highest self. I want to say empirical. I'm kind of moving away from higher self to lower self even because even that concept has caused uh, humanity and people in, you know, conspiratainment crowds to take the, <laughs> the reptile, you know, like the lizard brain, the brainstem. And personify that as reptilians from Zeta Reticuli. Like they've, people have run so far from shadow in the love and light only new age type of communities that the shadow has been turned into a reptilian alien that is coming from light years away to enslave us. But don't worry, the bird, the blue bird people are going to fix it. And I'm just like, how do you not see the archetypes of this? The bird and the lizard, the snake, the one in the air and the one that crawls on the ground on its belly, hires and lowers. Masculine and feminine, yin and yang, it's the same thing. You're just like, when you don't have this way of seeing through the lens of archetypes, you miss a lot of correspondences and a lot of the way that the 
as within, so without reality works is obscured to you. So I think this is like key symbolic literacy, super key. And uh, this, your book is great for this. I think that someone new to this could actually really get far and catch up to the level of someone that's looked into these things tangentially for a long time by spending some time focusing in on these core archetypes of which there are more than what you have in the book. There's hybridization between all of them, but Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's really good stuff. (laughs) I don't know Mm -hmm. where to go question wise from there, but I, I'm cause I kind of think you have some responses to all the stuff I just laid down. Yes. Especially about AI. I I love what you were saying. Uh, I love everything you're saying. Actually, you're so smart chance. It's, it's insane. I, I really admire your intellect and the, the artificial intelligence is, is um say you know out in the world right now if you if you look at that uh cons- conspiratainment <laughs> which is a good word i love me is... conspiratainment i mean don't get me wrong i'm listening to it <laughs> yeah, but i'm yeah, exactly. trying to have discernment too <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you gotta and so you know we're 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 all um, afraid or, you know, we're seeing this onslaught of AI technology and it's not, it's not a, a fiction by any means. It's, it's coming down the pipe and it can be found in, in the inner world, in the inner verse as well. Uh, that the, these, these, these programs say, say when um, an archetype is in, in shadow and, it, and it's operating without your conscious consent, it's, it's operating by tacit consent it's just by default and it has no <clears throat> life of its own again it's not it's not demonic it's not it's not a, a takeover of any kind it has no none none of its own energy and i even believe that to be true say if you're dealing with a demon i think it has none of its own energy i believe it is an ai as well because the evil forces all they can do they have no creative power all they can do is borrow your creative power and 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 flip it and turn it and and make it upside down and uh, practically useless to you or worse than useless harmful. And this is what we have at the at the level of the psyche. That it's a constant study for me to to see. Okay, things are things are sideways or feel sideways or whatever is going on. What program in me am I operating without my conscious awareness that is bringing about some result in my life? So I'll use an example of um, my son and I had a falling out when he was 11. Very devastating for uh, any parent to have a falling out. And he moved out, right? He packed his bags <laughs> and he moved to his dad's. And unfortunately, his dad said, okay, and, and didn't you know press him to say, well, you know what, you got to work things out with your mom. And uh, it was a total knock him down. It was a complete breakdown for me. And I was, I was uh, holding my head. I was trying to work on my son because I was sure he had problems. And I was trying to work on my son's dad. I was very sure he had problems. And, you know, I had somebody say to me at the right time, even though this is stuff I know, we, we all need to hear it, what we know over and over and over again. And, uh, and they just said to me, you know, there's nothing so attractive as a happy parent. And it, it, it was the moment of flipping it for me where I stopped all that working on any situation outside of myself. I went 100% back into, you know, becoming that happy parent. I'm, I'm a happy person, but I hadn't been a happy parent. And I did the work and I did the work and I did the work. Next thing you know, and I, and I, lost, I lost my obsession about that they should change. I completely forgot in, in being consumed with my own self and gaining my own energy back. Next thing you know, my son starts to say, hey, mom, I'd like to get together with you, where he had pushed me out for a time. And he started to confide in me, to tell me his problems, how he was upset or something that he went through, signs of, of true intimacy and trust. And, and this was all 100% from just doing the work inside myself. Right. So by by seeing that artificial intelligence, that it had my energy, my happiness energy, my love, love energy, my life energy and reclaiming it, saying, OK, the artificial intelligence, you don't have to operate anymore. Thank you for trying to save me. It ain't working. You, you, you'll be you'll be good. I'll take care of you now instead of taking my instructions from you. And then I saw a miracle before my eyes. Right. So, so that's, that's the, I always tell people you need proof for this stuff that it's working. So this isn't a belief system. It's experiential and you can definitely access it 
as soon as you stop, you know, blaming others or whatever for why you're unhappy and just cut out the stuff that you know that's hurting you. Because every time I've ever been really focused on an external relationship or situation to the point of self-sabotage, I was actually already self-sabotaging in other ways and just using this this thing to ignore the other ways. As soon as I fix the other ways of self-sabotage, then the other situations that were frustrating become less sticky because I feel good. I, I already feel good, so I'm not as frustrated as easily. And then that kind of just allows the whole flow to unconstrict. And then if if the other person doesn't want to be in that combative state anymore, they'll be more magnetized or attracted to you because you feel better. Therefore, you feel better to them, too, when they feel you. Or they just will move out of the field that you're in. That will, they'll no longer be part of the, the vibe because they don't want to transmute the vibe. Because you can't... The, the, the resonant vibe always takes precedence over the dissonant vibe. And that's like mm. the real alchemist power, right? And so then that dissonant, if the other person is wanting to be in a dissonant vibe, they will have to just leave to do it because you won't, you know, their victimhood won't be profitable in your presence the same way that it was when you were allowing it to frustrate you and allowing that energy to kind of leak out. And I mean, I experienced this personally so many times, like you said, it's not something to just believe. Yeah, you can, you can definitely know it. And man, mm -hmm. if I didn't have something else good to bring up about that whole part, oh, I guess, you know, this probably wasn't what it was, but I was thinking of a funny example from your book was the, uh, the when you first started learning some movement practices from a, a guru style teacher in India and having to start out at like, you know, short 10 or 15 minute sessions and Five. Five minute sessions. Can you <laughs> do you mind kind of telling that story about how, you know, your attitude towards the discomfort was kind of inviting the discomfort? I think this is an example in a way of what dynamic we've just been describing too, on top of the great example you gave about your son, which I think is definitely a a deeply personal, relatable thing for many people, whether it's their son or their their spouse or whatever. Yeah, in, in a lot of broken families where you you have no control over your children, actually, it's a fact. Uh, yeah, so many things. If, if you don't mind, I'll I'll go back and just speak quickly to to me. It is all an energy game, and it, you don't necessarily need to solve your problem. You need more energy, because again, like like energy heals cancer, energy solves problems. Right. The, the thing that you can't see your way to the other side of and you think there's literally no way to, to win. That's that's a, a, a composite program that I work with in my in my um, coaching is, is this can't win program. Well, real quick, and, the next note mm -hmm. in my notes was a quote from your book. If you're off course, you'll know it because you'll be losing energy. If you're on course, you'll know it because you'll feel a net gain of energy. I mean, that is the compass. I trick myself out of remembering that so many times in my life. And I always circle back to that and go, Oh, that's the only control switch you need to really be watching. That's, that's your whole cockpit is net gain or net loss of prana. You got it. And there's some tricks in there because you got adrenaline, which can, can feel like energy until you see it was fake energy or dopamine and that kind of thing. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a little bit tricky. It takes a very fine study. Are you losing energy or are you gaining energy? And you look in really close and go, oh, wow, it's sucking the life out of me. Okay, I guess that's not helping me and I won't hold on to that. So yeah, it's, it, it is super important that, that um, you know, I, I don't go into the flaky side of the energy work and all that kind of thing. It's just, if you're using your conscious life force to keep things in your unconscious, it takes so much of your power because that's that that rising the movement of energy that you're that's the force of life itself you are fighting with life you're going against the grain and, it, and there's a high cost to that that will suck the life out of you so if you just stop doing it right it's not like you have to conjure energy i think that's a new age bs and that's dangerous or for for other reasons but you you just have the energy you have we already have the spark of god the whole thing Right? It's like a hologram. We've got the whole thing in here, not a piece of it, not a part of it. And so I also love what you're talking about, the, you know, the saboteur and the victim come up. These, those are the prime archetypes, the, the subject of the next book I'm, I'm writing right now. And uh, I'm, I'm calling it I Did It because it is that, it is that experience of, of 
rather than blaming someone or something out there, and there's lots to blame. There's no end and and shortage to that. You can spend the whole day long coming up with those ones, taking an, an, an accounting of it. But if you flip it and you turn it around and you say, actually, I did it. And, and that's a very painful thing to say, you know, it, and it might even not seem real. Like you've got, again, so much evidence for it to be somebody else's fault. But if you just say, no, I did it. And then all of a sudden, all that energy that it took to, to suppress the, the truth of the situation and, and your, your true power, who you are, it comes back to you. And, and that, that pain just turns to like, wow, happiness. Oh my God, I'm prepared for something. All of a sudden I'm inspired and, and uh, I know what to do and how to be or, or what not to do and how not to be. Then the game is won in that moment. You might, you'll have a new moment come up <laughs> later about that. But uh, yeah, so the, the primal archetypes, maybe we could have another talk about, about those or, or later, maybe in your, in your, uh, in your second hour, we can get more into that. And then I think I lost the thread of the question that you originally asked. So oh, yeah. for that. I, I was uh, thinking about that funny story of how you got contorted a bit whenever you're first learning to get comfortable with discomfort. In a sense, there was a, you know, there was a, a, a teacher that was consistently putting you into okay. uncomfortable positions. <laughs> we'll say there. Okay, good. So funny. Yeah, I wrote that book. <laughs> and I guess Oh, so yeah, I that studied. was my life. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I know, I know. So I went to India eight times. I was obsessed with going to India. I had a white-bearded guru on the mountain. And on the way to the white-bearded guru, I got stuck a whole bunch of times. I got distracted in the south of India, particularly where the food was amazing. And uh, and I and I tripped on Pitabi Joyce. So anybody who's in the yoga world will likely know his name. He's the father of Ashtanga yoga. And I'm just, I'm just an accidental tripper. That's, that's my thing. I just, I'm following my intuition. It's very childlike. I'm just going where I see and feel the energy. So I met one of his students. Next thing you know, I'm there on Padabi Joyce's floor when he only had nine students in a room at one time. And, and that, you know, he went on to have thousands and thousands of followers all over the world, but here he is in just a little hut in India. And there I am. And he would literally beat me up every day. He would beat me up. That was my experience. He would, he would, he would take my body and force it into positions that I couldn't uh, do on my own. And it was painful. And I would cry every time. I, it, would, it would bring this sense of like, oh my God. I'm, and, and yet I couldn't just say like, hey, buddy, back off. That wasn't there. There was programming inside myself that was willing to accept this kind of, uh, it's not really behavior, but, you know, being, being manhandled and, and treated that way. Uh, you know, God knows where exactly he was coming from. There was lots of evidence to show he wasn't a, a, a truly benevolent leader of his own sort as well. But in, after, after I went through that first month and I'm kind of beat up, especially psychologically, and I'm thinking about a second month with him. And I had a little talk with another teacher that reminded me about who I am and, and why I'm here. And I had this epiphany that went off in me that, that made me realize this exact thing that, that I'm doing this. That I am, at least by not even um, arguing, saying like, that hurts, stop that. Then I was allowing it. Right. And, and, and ultimately, I was the one in control of that. It seemed like him and his, you know, big body and he would just like sit on you and slam you down into the floor. It, it, by all evidence, it seemed like he was doing it. But when I came to this awareness of, of the power inside myself to choose, I made a different choice. And it was, it was all internal. There was nothing particularly intellectual about it. And the next day I decided, I'm okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to do another 30 days. And it was like night and day. He was gentle with me. He was kind. He was encouraging. Uh, I didn't cry anymore. I got into my strength. I really started to develop my practice. I went from that five minutes to to working with him for an hour of a very intense yoga. I didn't I didn't keep that whole yoga uh, thing up. Now I just do it to save my life. But uh, you know, in the meantime, I proved to myself that it was all in my hands all along. Yeah, I really, I just really like that story because it proves that. It really just proves that the inner and outer have this 
dynamic and this reflection between them. And that also it highlights a very important piece of programming that I'm currently like looking for in myself with a magnifying glass as often as I think of it, which is the default acceptance of things that we hear that are told to us in the right format, with the right package that they must be just accepted as true uh, unless you can disprove them yourself which then that takes a lot of energy and people aren't usually, they don't usually have it to spare. So that it just stays in the probably true accept it by default category. And I don't even want people to do that with me, like listening to me. Uh, and that's kind of the place you're coming from as you went into that teaching situation, which was that, well, if he wants to bend my body in this way and thinks that it's what I should do, even though it hurts really bad and it's making me cry, I'm just going to let it happen. And people let themselves get the shit kicked out of them every day by the the lies on the TV and let that beat them up. And like, I know people with real emotional scarring over the pandemic stuff that was all like a made for TV movie. Nobody they know actually got seriously messed up where if that person was claimed to have been killed by it. It's like, uh, it's not like bodies piling up in the street. You know, I, I want to be sensitive about it. I know that people have had some personal direct experience with it, but I also know that my zetetic personal experience with it has been completely different than what has come through on the news. And so the, when that situation all came about about a year ago, I felt one day when it was all starting to really pick up and they're like lockdowns now one day at the beginning of it for about three minutes, I felt myself going, oh, shit, what if I get sick? What if I die? And that was me starting to get beat up by the lie a little bit and accepting it as true by default because I couldn't disprove it, right? But I, I noticed it immediately and went, oh, that's the black magic. That was the spell. And as soon as I noticed that that was a spell, like that was some, in, some mild intent being, you know, programmed into me, that was it. I never had any further doubts about what was going on in terms of the pandemic. I never lost sleep about it never worried about my mom and dad or anything. And it's really empowering. But I think that that should be our default mode is to, uh, I learned this from James True, actually, to give him credit for speaking this idea to me, which is that, yeah, we we should let other people, the default should be that the other person has to prove it's true to you, not that you have to prove it's not true. And then, you know, if it's something you care about, you already want to prove that it's true to somebody. So like we're putting the energy in the right place instead of inverting it. Like you kind of mentioned that things get so inverted, but yeah, we're moving into the uh, last, let me check the time. I think last five to 10 minutes here uh, about five or eight minutes. I mean, that's not really strict. I don't know why I'm saying all that, but <laughs> <laughs> I want to see what you might have that you would want to wrap up or make sure goes out to the free people in terms of ideas. This has been a little bit all over the map, but in the way that I like, uh, <laughs> I like these tangents. I like, I think there's been a good flow to this one and I, I yeah, I, I love this and thank you. And please wrap up any loose ends you have in mind or tell people things about how they can work with you or connect with you, you know, take the, as long as you need on that for sure. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, if you want to solve out the mysteries in your life, when things especially keep happening the same way over and over and over again, that stuff is trying to get your attention. And uh, if you want to go deep into it and use archetypes to decode the process, I'm totally here for you. You can visit bethmartins.com as a hub to everything. Um, uh, by the way, Anarchopoco is coming up. So I'm not totally sure when this is running, but March 8 to 11 <clears throat> is the time that uh, I'm going to be speaking on the main stage there. And I didn't even beg for that gig. They they invited me to be there. So I keep joking about that. There's some pretty big uh, names speaking on that stage. Mark Passio, Del Bigtree, Andrew Kaufman, uh, on and on. There's there's a whole slew of uh, big king heroes taking place there. <clears throat> so I highly recommend it. And you can, if you like, and you haven't got a ticket yet, you can use a code BETH10 to get a savings on your ticket. So whether that's virtual or, or uh, if you're going to show up in, in person, unfortunately, the travel arrangements are not kind at all. So I'm not going to be there in person this year. I was last year. So I just want to make sure to let people know about that. 
And uh, you can pick up a copy of my book, Journey, A Map of Archetypes to Find Lost Purpose in a Sea of Meaninglessness at my website. And I'll ship it out to you. You you immediately get a PDF copy so that you don't have to wait for shipping if you want to dive in and solve out some problem that you're having uh, in this moment. It is a kind of book I've seen people use over time and turn to again, and it, it doesn't get old, this stuff. It's It goes on and on. Sometimes I have to refer to my own work and like, what was going on with that archetype as well? Because we're blind to our own stuff for the most part. Uh, there's an archetype quiz there. In 10 minutes, you can find out where you are on the path of purpose. So whether you're a king hero or more of a merpreneur, a mermaid who's trying to be valued or wants to be valued for your life purpose, then you can do one of those quizzes and find out one archetype, its gifts and its shadows, and right away get to, to work on that. So in 10 minutes, you can start the journey. And if there's only two rules about the hero's journey, it is to, to begin that journey and to stay on that journey. So you sometimes when you just get a little bit of self-awareness, you get a little bit of your <clears throat> excuse me energy back and then you can start to do something differently in your life and take that mysterious ongoing annoying or or even devastating problem and and see how it fits perfectly with your freedom and your awakening that it's not actually in your way, it is the path forward. Uh, so you can also sign up for the primal um, power, pardon me, the, the power hack videos that lead to the primal power course. And maybe this is something you and I can talk about in the second hour, the makings of the next book and, uh, and encourage your listeners to, to make sure that they, they jump over with you into that uh, second hour where things can be more candid. And uh, so you can get those and there's a, a um, a webinar that you can get for free on the hero's journey itself. So if you're not as familiar with the hero's journey, then you can, you can go back to that. I should say for this first hour that, that the hero's journey is not only a chance to slay your own demons and dragons and have your own problems resolve in your life. It is about resolving your problems so that you can help others do it. Because that's the true hero's journey where you turn around and become the resource to others. It's not enough to solve your own problems. You won't be satisfied by that. You're going to be forever chasing that ball and and solving more and more and more micro problems of your own. But if you turn it around and you start saying, okay, how is my life meaningful to others? And that's the definition of meaning right there right? There, nobody has meaning in isolation. There is no purpose without connection. This is contribution. We had the most beautiful, if you, if you don't mind a one minute story, we had the most beautiful meeting. This pandemic has, has gift, uh, gifted us in, in these beautiful relationships. I have all kinds of new best friends. My old best friends don't want to talk to me anymore, but, <laughs> and here we were, you know, we went out into the forest and we had a fire. This happens we to me sitting. too. I'll just say old best friends mm-hmm. don't really want to talk, but I have all these cool people I know from doing this and I love it. Yes, exactly. That's how it goes. And you said it earlier, when energy decides, you raised your energy. And there's some people who are going to come along with that. And there's some people who decide, no, that resonance, it's it's too, or that, that dissonance, it's too much for me. I can't go inside that. It's not, I'm not going to use it to challenge me and, and uh, get into greater courage so I can be that higher energy too, or, you know, the, the higher, the lower. I know there's uh, problems there, but higher frequency, whatever you want to call it. And then, and then your life becomes the, the invitation to people to rise. And it's fearless because you will, you will potentially have to walk away from a best friend. All of my family, you might have heard me say it, doesn't want to talk to me anymore because I spoke out against this stuff. And, and they think I'm a lunatic. I'm surprised they haven't done an intervention on me. But I was so gifted to to come back and have all these new people. So we're sitting around this beautiful fire. And, and it was just the taste of this convivi- convivial life where people are on the same page. There's absolutely no filter. I don't have to think, okay, who, can, who am I around? Who, can, I, can they handle that? Can I say this? Can I say that? And it was just this boom, 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 truth after truth after truth. So many layers. And I'm like, oh my God, I should be recording all of this stuff. It's so incredible. So that's, you know, and it, it, it's very purposeful. All we did is sit around a fire, right? It seems like nothing, but it was incredibly on purpose and energizing and brought me to a place of, of great happiness, just to go and sit in around a fire, right? So this is the potential that's there for people. 
I'm really glad it kind of worked its way back to this point where you remind us that purpose and meaning exists in context only. And our personal life's meaning can therefore only exist in context to other life. And we are not an isolated vacuum of uh, getting lost on the path of self-perfection, which is like basically making the destination into the, the, the journey instead of the journey into the goal or, or what have the, you. Then it becomes an obsession, obsession and compulsion. That's the shadow of the lover archetype right? That you're always searching for some version of perfect that is not the conscious search for excellence, which I, I totally subscribe to. And uh, and yeah, you, you are lost in that rabbit hole. That's one of my missions with the truth community as well that uh, we can talk about in the in the next hour. Absolutely. If you guys aren't already like, okay, this is the one I'm going to sign up to plus four because you got to hear more of Beth because it's been amazing. I'm also going to be asking her to give us kind of a run through of the archetypes that she puts the blueprints out for in her book. And it might be a good jumping off point for anyone listening to go, Oh, that's the one that is giving me a ding, ding, ding on my inner bell and uh, do some work there. And I mean, this, the reason this system is so useful is because like you said, you've turned 20 years of working on this into a, a path and a process that, Someone could actually take up for themselves just by reading your book because it's you that has to do it either way or by working consciously with you as a coach can get them there way faster than 20 years. This is a refined and beautiful set of symbols that I think anyone can make their own. So thank you, Beth. We will see everybody on the other side and definitely check out Beth Martins on YouTube and her book is well worth your time no matter how far you are. On your hero's journey, there's always a new leg of it to initiate. And yeah, we're going to talk about that cycle a little bit more in hour two. Thanks, everybody. All right, here we go again. Second try on this outro. First one was great. Solid 22 minutes, but then didn't have my interface on. (laughs) So it was just recording through the webcam. And the audio sounded like I was talking to you through a tin can. So uh, then after I convinced myself not to put it out that way, I almost did, I guess out of a fear that I couldn't repeat it or do as good of a job. We'll see. You'll never know (laughs) if this is good or not. You'll get this one and you'll be like, wow, how eloquent, how wonderful. And really, that's what you should be thinking about, Beth. I absolutely loved the conversation I had with her. Her book is super readable. I read a lot of books from independent authors and... She's got the the thing polished better than most, and the uh, information is concise and clear, and it flows really well. And I found it pr- so easy to read that I think I knocked it out in maybe four or five sittings that I did mostly while doing cardio at the gym. So it'd be a <laughs> it's kind of a great way to read actually because you can do it on the Kindle app on your phone or if you had a tablet or something. Just get on a bike machine and go hard for an hour while reading. It actually helps you, at least for me, it helps me focus on the reading part and not get distracted. Because if I'm just sitting on the couch at home trying to read, within a few minutes, there's something around me in my space to call my attention to it. So, hey, maybe that's a pro tip. Read while doing cardio. It's a win-win, right? So the book was really helpful for me. I kind of pinpointed what might be the primary archetype shadow I've been dealing with. I don't know if I want to say that the nurturer is my primary archetype because I don't even think I have a primary archetype, honestly. And and maybe if I did more work with Beth and took the like archetype quiz, I'd change my mind about that. Who knows? Maybe you guys see a primary archetype in me really clearly. But we all can suffer through the different shadow expressions of these archetypes in our life or suffer from other people's expression of those shadows in a way, but that's also us having the wrong boundaries with the archetype within. It's very interesting, complicated and simple at the same time, but what's within is without, right? And so anyway, I watched this with a a friend in his work situation recently. It's not even really resolved. And even with myself, which is this shadow that the nurturer part of ourself does where we really want to be needed and essential and crucial so badly that we overgive and we don't hold up 
the right boundaries. And it's so hard to even tell that we're doing it because we're like, we're convinced we're doing it out of love. And it's not that you aren't doing it out of love. It's just that you're forgetting that you also got to love yourself. And it's tricky, man. But I fall into this thing where I might give a lot. And then at the time, I'm not keeping score. But then later, I'm like, man, I kind of feel like I gave way more than I got. (laughs) And so, like, which is it? Am I keeping score or am I just giving to give? And I don't know. This ties into the stuff we talked about with Ryan Kemp last time about transactionality. And as much as I get the idea of not being transactional and not trying to make things even and fair, on the other hand, there is like an energy economy between us that does function better if it is more fair. So it's hard. It's hard. I mean, maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle. Like you don't keep score down to the dollars and cents uh, every last bit of change in terms of the relationship energy flow between you and other people, especially because keeping score with money is an artificial value system anyway. So those values that you're assigning to time and to objects are like arbitrary uh, as can be and not really rooted in truth. So I think the key is to fall back on this idea of, oh, let me, okay, I had it. I had the direct quote in my notes, but I don't have that program open. So I'm just going to try to paraphrase it. Basically, this is a quote from Beth's book, and it's something that I figured out on my own before more than once and then forgot and then remember it again. But you will know you're on course if you feel a net gain of energy. If you feel like you're losing energy, that's a sure sign that something is off. And you'll know, you'll only be able to know the difference if you practice the discernment long enough and Follow the things that build your energy and avoid the things that drain your energy long enough that you can start to see differences in your inner and outer terrain from that energy. And even just that that idea, that concept being something that I've realized before and then forgotten before. Well, the reason I forget it is because I get into a lower energy valley and I'm not up higher on the peak of having more energy. And so there's things that I'm just not able to perceive or be aware of. So in my highest energy times in my experience and sometimes some kind of wild, even like spiritual emergency, high energy experiences, there's this knowing and this intuition of things that is just so solid. And it's just, bam, like, yeah, like I know this, I know this. And then you forget it, (laughs) you forget. I think it has to do with memory being part of our, our field, like our electromagnetic field. Memory's never been isolated and pinpointed to exist in the brain somewhere. That's just a fact. And I think that we see that people with worse energy levels have worse memories. Like, that's just an obvious, to the point where, like, someone's field is really compromised at the level of having Alzheimer's. They can't remember things even from breakfast to the afternoon, right? So, or even long-term stuff. I think it's all part of our field. And so hopefully that reminder of something that we all know innately that actually our course is completely like the bumpers on the bowling alley for us are our energy. Like, do we feel like we're leaking and lagging and dragging and can't focus, can't remember? Or do we feel like we're getting stronger every day and happier maybe isn't even always the right word because you'll feel... (laughs) In this process that I'm talking about, there's a pendulum swing, especially when you start getting over the humps of what are your most immediate and like recurrent problems. There's like a pendulum swing of they flare up harder and they try to drag you. They try to cause you to shed that charge you're building because it's like, I don't know, it's like training. You're training yourself. So you got the lesson. Now, now you got to take the test and maybe the test has like three parts and or five parts and it needs to repeat get a little more severe or intense or variation on the theme, but then it can kind of level out until you uh, drop back down to a lower energy level again, and then you might start that ride again. But this is just how it feels for me in my own personal life. Uh, Been going a solid eight minutes here, and I think this is even better than the first time I did this outro. So that's great. Huzzah. And one of the things about Beth that I really loved was the fact that that concept, though, applied to the conversation is that I felt like I had more energy after that conversation than before it. And after reading her book, her book felt like it was giving me energy, too. 
the perspectives were just really helpful like that. So I hope you guys check out her website, bethmartins.com. That's M-A-R-T-E-N-S, her YouTube channel, also with findable by her name. All that's in the show notes, the episode description. Uh, also, the second hour. Yeah, there's a whole second hour of this show if you didn't catch the first hour. If you're new around here, we do that on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Interverse for five bucks a month, you get the whole archive of extended shows. And in this one, we talked about actually Beth gave us a breakdown of the actual hero's journey using the archetypes that she has described in her book. Of course, it's nowhere near the depth that you'll get from the 200 ish pages that her book has on this subject. But it was a good way to maybe help you see the flow of this stuff and how it how you can apply it to your life might even help you see which one you're currently grappling with because we went over some of the the qualities and like light and shadow of each of those archetypes as we went some of them we had to skip through to get finished but not skip through but went a little faster near the end either way i think those early archetypal phases in the journey trip us up more anyway so it's good to uh get into that it's more the 3d physical world stuff and we talked about things that are going to be in beth's new book I'm not sure when the release for that is planned or if there is a plan or she's just working on it, but she's got more to provide on this topic, lots more, and it was cool to get kind of a sneak peek of stuff that maybe she hasn't even presented anywhere else or talked about. So exclusive to Plus is all that and more. At the beginning, I kind of used her as my own archetype therapist, not like extensively, but I definitely threw out some of my own life examples that I thought resonated with things she was talking about in the book and uh, for selfish reasons because <laughs> I wanted to see what she made of it and yeah did not disappoint great conversation hope to work with Beth again and hope to be on her show again I was there like a month ago talking about the ring of truth and that was a really cool conversation if you didn't catch it you can see it on my YouTube I reposted it to My audio RSS feed, so you probably already did see it if you follow the show. But if you found, yeah, I don't know. If you found this episode and you didn't find the other conversation I did with Beth, you probably will like it because she's awesome. Uh, On the plus thing, I got to talk about a few things regarding plus. I don't do a good job of keeping you guys updated with how it works. Uh, I kind of like don't repeat myself on things where it would be actually useful to repeat myself. So I'm going to go over plus a little bit more like if you get it or if you already have it, what you can do to access the content and what content is there. So first of all, people that watch on YouTube might not realize they could subscribe on an RSS feed like iTunes podcast app or Spotify or things like that and get an audio version of the show. But on the other hand, people that do the audio version of the show might not realize there's video versions of almost every episode. I mean, there's always a a video on YouTube, but most of the time I have our webcams going and so you can see us. So that's kind of cool. I put in some neat visualizers that are unique, artistic, maybe too intense psychedelic kaleidoscopes in the backgrounds of the videos. That's a lot of fun for me. And I uh, like it if people see that just because I put a little time into it each week for myself because it's fun. Uh, so the other thing you need to know about Plus is that if you are like not sure how to access the content from Patreon other than going to Patreon's website, there is a Patreon app that works quite well. And from the app or from being logged into the website on a browser, like if you're on your phone, You can go to the My Membership section once you're subscribed to Interverse, and there's a link that you can click on that will open your podcast app of choice, whatever you use to play podcasts, will open that link and sign you in through Patreon to get the RSS feed, the updating feed of audio episodes delivered to your podcast player the same way that any other show that you were subscribed to on it would work. So that could possibly make it a lot easier and you're not really having to mess with Patreon to stay caught up on the new shows. But back to the video thing, if you're using the Patreon app or looking at it through the browser, you can find video versions for the plus episodes too. So there's a extended video that is for patrons as well available there. And uh, the probably easiest way to find it might even be to just pop the link from the show description of the free version of the show. Or if you have that, 
uh, audio RSS feed link ho- hooked up to plus so that you're getting the audio show that way. If you look in the show description, there will always be near the top. It'll say video version of episode in the link. So if you ever want to quickly hop from the audio version to the video version, whether on free or plus, that link will be there. And that's the best I can do to make it as easy as possible through Patreon. And look, I don't actually like having to go be dependent on Patreon. I would love a different solution. If somebody has one, please let me know about it. I've kind of, I, I'm kind of looking at some other options. Um, haven't found the one yet, but there's a few more on my radar. However, I don't know that they'd really be better than Patreon, just like a different version of the same thing that's maybe not as big of a company. And I get it, you know, Patreon's part of the evil empire. They're probably going to do more censorship in the future. Not the greatest company to be supporting. But until I either get like a volunteer or have the money to pay somebody to rebuild my website, to have a membership feature that allows you to get the exclusive content for being a paid subscriber and for all that to work well, uh, we got to use Patreon for now. <laughs> That's just what it is. And I'm not, I'm not even scared that my stuff's going to get pulled off there. I'm really not. So I, I just don't think that I've, I'm that type of vibe to, to get censored. Like, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. It could happen to anybody. My friend David Whitehead just got his YouTube channel deleted. I was, I was there when he was reacting to it. Uh, reacting, I should say. He wasn't like freaking out. He was just like, yep, there it goes. Like he, he knew that day was coming too. And I said I was there. We were on webcams because we were about to do an episode of his show, Unslaved, which you can catch if you're a member there, unslaved.com. I've done four podcasts with them now. And the last two were uh, put together a five ish, five and a half hour series on the cyber terror that I did with Lindsay from Rogue Ways. And Michael Tesserion is the researcher and author who is like the, the heart of Unslaved. Not that David doesn't count, but they're going through Michael's research material typically. And Michael has so much to say about the tarot. I learned most of what I know about it from him. So having him break down the transhuman tarot from cyberpunk was quite amazing. And uh, he really framed it in a different way than the last time we covered the content. So I didn't even think it was repetitive too much. You might not want to look at those pictures again, and I get that. But it was really cool because he kind of showed this distinction between the hermetic and the Gnostic sides of the symbolism in the tarot and what that means. And a lot of a lot of hardcore red pilling about Gnosticism, <laughs> uh, if you're curious about that. I would definitely check it out and, you know, sign up to Interverse Plus first. But if you have another six dollars, get a month of Unslaved and check out those shows for sure. But definitely do Interverse Plus first because I have way fewer members than they do. I could use your support. And uh, yeah, another thing to say about Patreon about I know that it's an evil company and all that. Right. I think there are some of you out there that either quit being members. I know there's at least one that quit being a member. And maybe some that never signed up because you hate Patreon and you don't want to support it. And I get it. But if you'll hear me out by canceling a membership with me because you don't like Patreon, you are hurting Patreon less than 50 cents, maybe less than 50 cents a month. And then you're hurting me, whatever the rest of the $5 is that they don't take the cut out of. So hurting me. I mean, it doesn't hurt me not to get your money. Like, I'm not physically hurt. But metaphorically, I'm the one that gets most, that takes the hit there. They don't take a hit. And like, yeah, if we all boycott it in mass, sure. But I don't have enough members that if they all quit, that Patreon would even bat an eyelash. And so just think about that. I, it's me you're supporting, not Patreon. Patreon's just the tool that right now we're using. But if enough of you were supporting me through it, I would, as quickly as possible, get a better system going. But, you know, like one of the other options I looked at is called Locals, and it seemed really cool, and I did the legwork getting a page set up for that. And then at the end, it's like, yeah, you actually can't post more than 30-minute videos unless you have at least 100 subscribers. And I was like, ah. (laughs) You know how hard getting to 100 was if I'm even there? Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. Maybe I've been there. Maybe I dropped below it. 
I don't know. <laughs> I I would love more of you guys to be getting those second hours, though. It's not like I'm asking for something for nothing. Already getting what I think is a great show for free, and the second hour is always juicier. How could it not be? How could it not be? But yeah, I, 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 I think I've talked about all that enough, and we're getting pretty long in the tooth on this outro. Definitely wasn't trying to beat 22 minutes and um, getting there quickly. So let's wrap it up. Uh, make sure that you check the show description, like always, for links to all the things that we talk about, to Beth's page, to her book, to ways to support Interverse. You can do that in many ways. Leave a review on iTunes, like a five-star review. Uh, you can buy something from the Secret Energy Shop using my affiliate link. Someone did that the other day. Whoever you are, thank you. And I hope you got a cool supplement that is going to be helpful for wherever you're at. And uh, other things you can do to support the show would be, I guess, you could just send a PayPal donation. If you're like, no, I don't like Patreon. I'm still not convinced, but I'll pay you through PayPal. That'd be cool. And I wish I had the ability to just have that set up. Where, and, but I can't send someone a link to every show that is paying me you know, manually that way. So I don't want to start that. I'm going to play us out though with a really cool new track from Cadella. Cadella is a homie of mine and has been featured on the outro music many times. And I do tend to play music for my friends more than anything else. Cause at first I already know I have permission and second, I really like it, but you're out there and you got music that you think I'd like, or you make music. That'd be even better. Why not share it with me? Chance at interversepodcast.com is my email, or just hit me up through one of the many social media accounts that I've got going. And uh, I'd love to get more music in my world to expand my mind map into different directions sonically. <clears throat> ah, yeah. This has been a long monologue. <laughs> okay, so it's called Far Away by Cadella. We're going to play out with that. And you know what? On this episode, the graphics I made for the video version, I think they were like the coolest ever. So if you are not watching the video and you want to see a cool, trippy visualizer I made for this episode that I think was really dope, pull up the episode, skip to the end, and listen to this cool song with the kaleidoscope I made and enjoy it. Have a little moment of mindfulness and getting into the groove of some great tunes. And I'm out of here. Much love to you all. You guys are awesome. Thanks for listening. <laughs> and be uh, be good to yourself out there. Have compassion. All right. Talk to you later. <laughs>